actually, writing is something each of us is capable of doing. We may think that we lack a literary background and are thus incapable of writing, but this is not so. If we record just one or two occurrences that we hear or see every day, the outcome would be very similar to this book. From this, we can see that persuading people by speech and persuading generations by written words is not difficult. As long as we have the heart of sincerity and the persistence to pursue this act of benevolence. From the book. We can persuade others by word of mouth as well as by writing books to promote virtue. Compared with teaching others through behavior, this is much more direct and obvious. Sometimes we do not have time to teach others through behavior. Then verbal or written education will be more effective. However, if we can apply it like the right medicine for an illness, often it will prove to have wonderful effects. Therefore, we cannot give up." End quote. This previous category is referred to as associate embracing in Buddhism. This means that we should interact with others, with those whom we are trying to help, by using our own actions as examples to influence them. Similar to what Emperor Shun did with the fishermen. In Buddhism, four guidelines are used to guide and influence all sentient beings. This is called fourfold embracing methods. The first method is giving which is a good way to establish affinity and amicability with others. Once we have earned the confidence of others, then whatever we say or do will create a positive effect on them, and they will be willing to follow our suggestions. The second method is kind words. This does not mean we use glib talk to sway others. Kind words means to act with flexibility and to help them be comfortable. As explained by Master Zhong Feng earlier in this lesson, when our motivation comes from loving kindness for others, then even if we scold or hit them for their own good, it would be an act of kindness. But when we are scolding, we should take into consideration their ability to withstand and accept the reproach. If they reject it when we have overdone it, then our words will have a negative effect. Therefore, when we intend to speak to others of their faults, we should make sure that no one else is present, 
so they will not feel either embarrassed or antagonized. This is an example of being flexible and making the person feel comfortable. The third method is beneficial and advantageous conduct. This means that our words and actions must be truly beneficial to others. The fourth and last method is cooperating with and adapting oneself to others. This is to participate in the same activities as others and to be a good example to guide them. When the Buddhas guide all sentient beings, they do not exceed these four methods. When we are encouraging others to be good, we are using verbal education. When we are joining others to teach and show them kindness, we are using behavioral education. Herein lies the difference from the book. If we make the mistake of losing a person, it was proper for us to guide this person, but we did not. Or, wasting our words, it was improper for us to persuade this person, and we tried to. We would do well to reflect and generate the wisdom not to make the same mistake again." End quote. When we are able to advise someone, but we do not, then we have lost an opportunity to teach. If a person has potential to do good, but we do not lead him or her on the right path, then we have lost a person. On the other hand, if someone is set in his or her ways and will not listen to us, but we persist in trying to change him or her to no avail, then we have wasted our words. When interacting with others, we should learn to use our common sense to observe how they are reacting to us. This will prevent us from losing a person or wasting our words. Master Hui Nung expressed it very well in the Platform Sutra. When others are willing to listen and accept we teach them, but when they are not, we simply put our palms together and wish them well. From the text. What is meant by helping those in desperate need? During one's lifetime, people will suffer from serious difficulties. If we meet someone like this, we can help that person as if we were the one who was suffering. We immediately come to this person's aid. If a person has been wrongly accused or convicted, we should plead on their behalf as well as provide aid in any way we can. 
Scholar Schweitzer once said, it does not matter whether a favor is big or small. What is important is that it is done at a time when others need it most. These are words of loving kindness." End quote. Everyone is bound to encounter some misfortune during their lifetime. This is especially true during a war, when people are forced to suffer overwhelming losses such as those of their home. In such situations, as they drift from one place to another, they will have no idea what is going to happen next. Presently, we are living in a relatively peaceful world in which parents have many opportunities to spoil their children. However, will our world always be this peaceful? If we honestly look at the way we are headed, the future looks bleak. It would be most unfortunate if the aforementioned hardships and suffering were to occur during our midlife or old age. Therefore, when we meet others who are suffering, we should treat them as if we were suffering and we were suffering the same hardships, we should quickly do everything we can to help. This is the giving of fearlessness. When others are oppressed or wronged, we must help them by pleading on their behalf and do whatever we can to prove their innocence. When they suffer from continuous hardships and we are unable to help them by ourselves, then we must alert others and encourage them to join in the effort. Scholar Suetze said that whether we are able to help a great deal or just a little, what is important is that we help when others need it the most. However, while we are able to provide assistance in an emergency, poverty is a different issue. The best way to help those who are in poverty is to help them to learn ways to earn a living, to learn how to support themselves and to become independent. This is the greatest act of kindness. From the book, what is meant by developing public projects for the benefit of others? Small construction works are needed for villages, and big construction jobs are needed for cities. As long as it is beneficial to the people, it should be built." End quote. On a small scale, we can benefit a village. On a larger scale, we can benefit a city or a county. Today, this is known as social welfare. Every citizen, every governing body, would do well to consider it their responsibility to do good deeds for the benefit of all others. 
we should do everything that benefits an area. Only when everyone has good fortune will we have good fortune as well. But if we alone enjoy good fortune while others are suffering, then for us, adversity is not far behind. A Chinese proverb says, one family's wealth can arise resentment in thousands of other families. If we share our good fortune with others, this will help create a stable society and a peaceful world. This will then become true good fortune. When we share our good fortune with others, this is a sign of exhibiting great wisdom, great good fortune, and virtue. Today, when we speak of developing public projects for the benefit of others, we can do so by advocating and encouraging others to practice the teachings in Liao Fan's Four Lessons and in Mahayana Buddhism. From the text, Public projects can be the construction of systems to irrigate farmlands, dams to prevent flooding, or bridges to facilitate travel. Also, we can give food and water to those who are hungry and thirsty. Whenever we have the opportunity, we need to encourage others to do their share as well, to help accomplish the project, either through the sharing of wealth or of labor. Do not be afraid of what others might say and do not become frightened when the job becomes difficult. Do not allow the jealousy and hatred of others to weaken our resolve to do good deeds." End quote. In China, agriculture was the foundation of the country. Thus the construction of irrigation systems was of paramount importance. Dams were necessary in order to prevent flooding. These construction projects were not built to benefit oneself, but for the benefit of everyone. Therefore, even when obstacles occurred during the construction, they were not allowed to deter the construction, the completion of a good deed. A good deed completed despite obstacles is considered full and complete. There may be opposition at the beginning of a project, but once it is completed and everyone has benefited from it, they will know its value and appreciate our efforts. Therefore, our vision must be all-encompassing and far-reaching we need to possess wisdom, loving kindness, and perseverance in order to accomplish good, the standard for which is to benefit all other beings. 
to be selfish, to benefit only ourselves, is not goodness. It was this standard that Master Zhong Feng spoke of from the text. What is meant by accumulating merits and good fortune by giving wealth? In Buddhism, giving is considered the foremost practice among all methods." End quote. This is the way to practice for good fortune. In Buddhism, there are infinite ways of practice. For the sake of simplicity, Buddhism has organized these infinite methods into six major categories. The six paramitas. Mahayana Buddhism teaches the six paramitas of infinite practices. If we were to summarize these six categories, then all six become one, all six become giving. There are three major categories of giving, that of wealth, teaching, and fearlessness. Actually, all the six paramitas are giving. For example, the paramita of abiding by the precepts, or self-discipline, and the paramita of patience can be considered the giving of fearlessness. The paramitas of diligence, deep concentration, and wisdom can be considered the giving of teaching. Thus, these three types of giving have encompassed, have encompassed all the methods of giving in Buddhism. No matter how many other ways there they are, they would all be found within the method of giving. In the Diamond Sutra, the Buddha taught us not to be attached to I who have given, to that which was given, and to who has received. This is the ultimate, perfect guideline for all ways of practice. Therefore, to give is to practice good fortune. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. Since the six paramitas are the ways to practice good fortune. Wisdom is part of good fortune. When we practice the giving of teaching, we gain intelligence and wisdom, which is considered good fortune. When we practice the teaching of fearlessness, we gain healthy lives and longevity. When we practice the giving of wealth, we gain wealth. The Chinese speak of these as the five good fortunes of wealth and prestige, longevity, merits and virtues, happiness and no adversities, and a good death. A good death is important because it can in turn lead to a good birth. And the best death is to die while chanting a Buddha's name to be born into the Pure Land. If we wish to attain 
perfect happiness in this world. We will not go wrong if we practice according to the teachings in this book. If we wish to attain perfect happiness beyond this world, then it would be enough to practice according to the teachings in the Infinite Life Sutra. If we just lead our lives according to the guidelines of the Infinite Life Sutra and the Alphonse Four Lessons, we will attain the great liberation in both this world and beyond. Thus, here we are encouraged to practice good fortune through giving. From the book. What is giving? Giving is to let go. A wise person who understands this principle would be willing to give away everything, even to the point of letting go of our attachments to the six sense organs within. Externally, one can also give away that which we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, and think. End quote. To give is to let go, is to give away. The more we give, the freer we become. A wise person who understands this principle is someone who has true wisdom, is like a bodhisattva. When we speak of letting go of the six sense organs and the six dusts, we are not speaking of letting go in the physical aspect. Think about it. How could we really detach ourselves from our bodies? Even if we were able to discard our body, it still would not solve our problems. Therefore, when we speak of letting go of the six sense organs, we mean to detach ourselves from the aspect of our mind. This means we do not have any attachments or discriminations within. We are not tempted by external phenomena. The Diamond Sutra tells us, do not attach to form. Remain unmoved within. Do not attach means to let go of the six senses. To remain unmoved within means to let go of the attachments to the six sense organs within. Once we have severed our attachments within and on the outside, we will no longer be deluded, but will have uncovered our self-natures and become Buddhas. In our innumerable past lifetimes, we have been deluded and have thus remained mired in the cycle of birth and death. However, from now on, we will not create any more life and death karma. Therefore, those who are wise would want to transcend our Saha world to be mindful 
of Buddha Amitabha and to be born into the Pure Land. We will maintain clarity of mind and await Buddha Amitabha to escort us to the Pure Land while we are alive, not dead. If we can go to the Pure Land after we die, that means that the transcendence ceremony really works. Actually, transcending the spirit from suffering only has a limited effect. We cannot transcend a spirit into the pure land. Just reduce the suffering. For instance, the Venerable Master Bao Zhu was the manifestation of great compassion, Bodhisattva. He transcended the spirit of Empress Liang Wu's Empress, but he could transcend her only as high as the second level of the desire heaven he could not help her to achieve any higher. He could not help her to be born into the Pure Land. Although we wish that we could transcend others to the Pure Land, it cannot be done. It is only our wish. Being born into the Pure Land depends on our own vow, belief, and practice. So we must learn the ways of practice while we are still healthy and strong to chant Amitabha and vow to be born into the Pure Land. To let go is to do so from the mind. It is to detach ourselves from the five desires of wealth, fame, lust, food or drink, and the six dusts of sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, and thought. We should neither be attached to our bodies nor to our minds. As ordinary people, we are filled with discriminatory thoughts and attachments and find it extremely difficult to detach ourselves from them. We always have wandering thoughts. The Pure Land way is to change our way of thinking so that we are mindful only of Buddha Amitabha. Once we change our thinking to only those thoughts of Buddha Amitabha, we will finally be free. Truly cultivating the Bodhisattva way is concentrating only on Buddha Amitabha and chanting only Ami Tofa. Yesterday I was asked to help answer an email. And I would also like to respond to it tonight. The sender expressed appreciation for what my teacher, Venerable Master Jing Kong, taught. But he said that he felt teachers, followers, and believers were saying that all of Buddha Shakyamuni's other teachings are meaningless and useless. 
and that the Pure Land School is supreme. I do not know who the sender was talking about, but there will always be students who in their enthusiasm seriously misunderstand what teacher says. I can only respond with what I have been taught by Master Jing Kong. When we say that Buddha, Amitabha, and the Pure Land are unsurpassed, we do not mean that they are better than any other methods. All methods are equal and unsurpassed. All sutras are equal and unsurpassed. All practices are equal and unsurpassed. No one is better than another. The Buddha taught 84,000 ways of practice because our root, our causes, our conditions are all different. What is most suitable for one person is not most suitable for another. We need to find the methods, the sutras, the practice that is most appropriate for us. All the methods were taught to us by our original teacher, by Buddha Shakyamuni. As teacher has often said, as we have often said, to say one method is better than another is wrong. It is to slander the Buddha. From the book. There is nothing we cannot give away. When we find ourselves unable to do so, we can start by the giving of wealth. Ordinary people regard their clothing and food as dearly as their lives. Therefore, they consider wealth to be of utmost importance. When we practice giving without hesitation, we can cure stinginess and at the same time help others in dire need. However, for many this is very difficult to do, especially at first. But gradually it will become more natural the more we give. This is the best way to cure selfishness and to rid ourselves of attachments and stinginess." End quote. The Diamond Sutra tells us that everything with form is illusion, is false. This teaches us to give to let go and be free of worries and attachments. If we find it difficult to do this, then we need to start by giving away our wealth so that we are not tempted or affected by wealth. This is also the method that the Buddha taught us to escape the cycle of birth and death to transcend the six realms of reincarnation, to transform ourselves from ordinary people to sages. It is always a little difficult when we first learn to give, so we often do so grudgingly. We may feel upset and perhaps even regret what we have done. 
This is when we need to use our wisdom and be determined to gradually make giving a habit. Then it will become very natural. Everyone will experience such a stage in their learning and cultivation. Eventually, as we give, we will experience a lessening in worries and stinginess when we no longer attach to wealth, to our enjoyments, our body, heart, and mind will feel great ease and liberation. This is when our self-nature will start to be uncovered and we will gain complete contentment and freedom. The law of cause and effect never changes either in this world or beyond. Therefore, the more wealth we give, the more wealth we gain. We do not even know where this wealth will come from. The more teaching we give, the more wisdom we gain. So we do not want to withhold any wealth, any knowledge. Poverty is the result of not giving wealth. Ignorance is the result of not giving teaching. Illness and short lives are the result of not giving fearlessness. The five good fortunes are all gained through giving. Giving is the cause. Therefore, if we wish to have the good result, then we must practice the good cause. It is a wandering thought to think that we gain the result without first planting the cause. This is impossible. From the book. What is meant by protecting the proper teachings? For millions of years, proper teachings have been a standard of truth and provided spiritual guidance for all living beings. Without proper teachings, how can we participate in and support the nurturing of heaven and earth? Without proper teachings, how can we help people to achieve, attain achievement? How can beings in all the realms succeed in their endeavors without a standard to live by? How can we be free of the five desires, the six dusts, our delusions, our afflictions? Without proper teachings, how can we set a standard in the world and help people transcend the six realms? End quote. Proper teachings are the personal achievement of wise sages, which have been proven by using the standards of truth and wisdom, such as those found in the teachings of Confucius and Buddha Shakyamuni. This shows how important it is to protect all proper teachings. In China, we protect the proper teachings by first safeguarding those of Confucius, Mencius, Lao Tzu, and Zhuangzi 
for they provide the foundation for Buddhism. There was no problem during Mr. Liao Fan's time because during the Ming Dynasty, all scholars studied the work of Confucius by learning the four books, the five classics, and the various schools of thought. Everyone had a good foundation in Confucianism. We need to understand this to see why Buddhism is currently undergoing difficulties and has declined. As it is the root, Confucianism taught us how to properly conduct ourselves. If we cannot even be a decent person, how can we possibly become a bodhisattva, much less become a Buddha? Our learning and practice to become Buddhas and bodhisattvas is built on the foundation of the humanities. Although we may not completely read the four books, which are the great learning, doctrine of the mean, Analects and Mencius, we should at least read the first three so that we will know how to conduct ourselves. This is the foundation of Buddhism, the basic of basics. We can compile good excerpts from the commentaries from the past and widely distribute them in the past, the books we printed were the version of stone printed books of China without any copyrights. They were the commentary of the four books written by scholar Shija. It would be good for us to print, distribute, and advocate it. Therefore, Buddhists would do well to read the four books. Truthfully speaking, we can only give rise to the heart if we have this traditional education. Nowadays, education places great importance on technology, forgetting the importance of the humanities. No matter how advanced our technology, if we have not studied the humanities, then as the ancient people questioned, what is the difference between humans and animals? Humans are animals. If we do not know morality, benevolence, and honor, then there will be little difference between humans and animals. Human beings are the cruelest of animals, the most ruthless. Therefore, in order to help all beings. Human beings must be helped first. If we can turn back from all that is bad to do all that is good, then all beings will be fortunate and happy. Only then can each sentient being achieve what they want. This is the goal of the sages and the virtuous people in educating and reforming all sentient beings. Proper teachings includes those of Confucius and Buddha. They have been the standard of truth, which has provided guidance for thousands of years. Heaven and earth have the merits 
and virtues, of giving rise to and nurturing infinite things. Heaven gives rise, earth nurtures. Heaven and earth have shown great kindness to all beings, animate and inanimate. Once we understand this principle, not only will we neither destroy nor harm the natural environment, we will do all we can to help the natural ecological balance to become perfect, to enable all beings to receive what they need the merits of heaven and earth are vast and great those who genuinely have morality and knowledge can participate in and support the rise and nurturing of heaven and earth the world's wise sages Buddhas and Bodhisattvas all do just this. As Buddhism says, if we can transform objects, objects and beings, then we are just like a Buddha. To transform objects means to change our mind. To change our views, our own thoughts, to let go of selfish desires and to participate in the light of the sky, earth, sun, and moon. To let go of our selfishness is true cultivation. True cultivation is wholeheartedly exerting ourselves to help all beings. Buddhas and Bodhisattvas propagate the teachings and help all beings, guiding them in letting go of delusion and attaining awakening like heaven and earth, to nurture all beings. The merit from this is immeasurable. To be able to transcend delu delusion and to be liberated from confinement means to end all afflictions and worries to uncover our wisdom and transform delusion into awakening. We are to use our behavior and conduct as do the sages and virtuous people. We use them as our models. The teachings of sages are classics and sutras. Their thoughts, speech, and conduct are correct and without error. They surpass the dimensions of time and space. We know that Buddhist sutras surpass time and space because 3,000 years ago, Buddha Shakyamuni helped people at that time. Today, as we read the sutras, we still feel that every sentence spoken by the Buddha is logical and should be practiced accordingly. This is true for the Pure Land Sutras, which teach how to transcend this world by attaining birth into the Pure Land in one lifetime. This is to transcend the world. In Buddhism, there are infinite ways to practice. For the sake of simplicity, Buddhism has organized these infinite methods into six 
major categories, the six paramitas. If we condense the categories, then all six become one. All six become giving. There are three major categories of giving. That of wealth, teaching, and fearlessness. The paramitas of abiding by the precepts of self-discipline and patience can be considered the giving of fearlessness. The paramitas of diligence, deep concentration and wisdom can be considered the giving of teaching. Thus, these three types of giving encompass all the methods of practice in Buddhism. India and China are very different, yet what the Buddha taught was fitting for both countries. Now, as it is being introduced into Europe and the Americas, it is still appropriate. It is so because it provides logical answers to the questions people are asking today. Why am I here? Why do good things happen to some people and bad things happen to others? In the Diamond Sutra, the Buddha taught us to practice giving, but to not attach to giving. To give is to practice good fortune. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. Since the six paramitas are the way to practice good fortune, wisdom is a part of good fortune. The Chinese speak of the five good fortunes of wealth, prestige, longevity, merits, and virtue, happiness, and no adversities, and a good death. For Buddhists and non-Buddhists alike, to practice according to the guidelines in the sutras that the Buddha taught, in the guidelines in this book, will result in attaining perfect happiness in attaining the great liberation, both in and beyond this world. Amitabha. Thank you.